Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the December 2020 uh, I2B2 Transmark Foundation community meeting. As usual, we will be recording this session and the recordings will be available along with the slide decks uh, on our website uh, in a couple in a day or so. We want to start with uh, a couple of uh, bits of foundation news. Uh, first of all, we will be conducting a platform survey uh, in uh, early January. Uh, this will involve uh, a, a form that we're going to send out to all our, our larger mailing list and asking people to give us a little bit of information about um, which of our platforms, I2B2 or Transmart, they're using and uh, some some uh, ideas of uh, what, you know, sort of what kinds of things they're, they're using the, the platform for and also give you an opportunity to give us some suggestions. Um, we haven't done a survey like this for a couple of years. Uh, last one, last time, it was quite uh, quite interesting to see um, a number of places using uh, a tra a Transmart and I2B2 that we uh, weren't aware of, and so it's always good to to hear about that. So watch that, watch for that in your mail, and uh, please just take a couple minutes. It will be very short, and you'll be able to fill it out in a few minutes. Um, uh, and please uh, respond uh, with that, that to that for us. <clears throat> Uh, the other uh, thing I wanted to mention is that we are starting up a, a Transmart uh, users working group in January. Uh, this will be, I think, later in the month. Um, and this will be just an open session to, for users of Transmart to uh, come and ask questions, talk about um, features, uh, review uh, aspects uh, of, of using Transmart or, um, you know, potential new features uh, that they're interested in. Uh, these will generally not have an agenda or, or very much of an agenda, but really a, a drop in session for uh, anyone who'd like to come and uh, talk about uh, using the system and, um, you know, get uh, help from others, uh, whatever we, we can do. So uh, we'll, we're going to get that started. You watch again your email and it'll be, uh, there'll be announcements for this. Uh, I'm thinking uh, something uh, like the fourth uh, Tuesday of the month. Um, and so we'll set that up for later in January. Okay, uh, Diane, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, I just wanted to um, remind people um, about our, our working groups. Um, we've got two meetings coming up this week. Um, so I just wanted to, to do a, a shout out for those meetings. One is tomorrow. It's the user interface um, working group. It's uh, at noon um, Eastern time. Um, and the, the agenda for that is the, you know, I think a lot of uh, folks know that we, um, the, the ACT group rolled out a new user interface um, recently, and they're um, enhancing it to include uh, temporal queries, and they have an initial design and they just wanted to get some feedback. So um, that is the agenda for uh, that meeting tomorrow. Um, on Thursday, we have our ontology um, working group, which is always a, a very um, active uh, group. Um, so please, if you're if you're interested in attending and joining these groups, um, let us let us know. Um, the other thing I want to mention is next um, community meeting in January, um, a uh, company called Biomeris. Um, the folks in in Europe will will know this company. They're actually out of um, Italy, and they are um, they've been working in the I2B2 community for many years um, in in Europe. And they've done a lot of great work in developing um, plugins and things, and so they're they're really starting to um, become more active in the um, in the foundation. So we've asked them to come and present, you know, who they are and and to talk about some of the the plugins and things that they've developed that um, that certainly could be contributed back to the the foundation. The last thing I want to mention is um, we we really really encourage. Um, folks, if they have a topic that they'd like to cover and, and uh, promote, to um, to let us know, and we'll we'll give you a, a slot um, on uh, the agenda for this meeting. Um, and don't forget, you know, soon enough it'll be June, and we'll be, we'll have our Harvard meeting, and maybe it'll be at Harvard, or maybe it'll be um, remote again. But um, certainly, uh, topics and things that uh, people are interested in presenting are always um, always welcome. So with that, I think Rudy, you can go to the next. Slide. We'll jump into our agenda where um, the next topic is uh, Jeff Klan will talk just a little bit about the uh, common data model um, uh, that we have uh, pulled together and the documentation that is now available. Um, and I just want to mention this is a, a 
a part of the work that we're doing with uh, the Dell Giving Grant. So um, great to see uh, progress um, um, around that grant. So Jeff, I'll let you um, take it from here. Yeah, sure, thanks. So I2B2 has for a long time, so I2B2 has for a long time had this common data model that uh, is a kind of a standard way of ingesting data, no matter what ontology you're using or what system you're using. But it got out of sync with uh, the data model used by another foundation product, Transmart. And so there were these two data models and um, neither of them were particularly well documented and there were links um, all over the place. And if you did, if you did, a, if you looked at the differences between the two data models, they were not dramatic, but they were significant enough to impede interoperability and many different um, ways of using the the fields and the data and different, slightly different data types and column names and things like that. So, our goal in this project has been twofold. One is to bring kind of documentation around this data model, which has never been uniformly documented in I2B2 or across both platforms, certainly, and also to unify this, these data models so there is one common uh, data model. So this is, the, uh, this is the gist of the common data model that we are, are developing. So it takes the core um, I2B2 Transmart tables, the fact table and the dimension tables, the patient, visit, concept, provider, and modifier dimensions, and unifies those uh, standardizes all the fields, makes the data types the same, um, and then we've, we're documenting all of these, all of this information: the tables, the fields, the keys, the indexes, the constraints, and uh, including best practices on how to use use these across both platforms. Um, there is a uh, a lot of documentation that I will flip through in a live mm -hmm. way in just a moment, but we have, like for example, this very complete spreadsheet that shows the um, the names of all the fields, the uh, what the data type is called in the different database platforms, um, a little bit of information about the field, the description, and the history of when it first when it first appeared in I2B2. And I was I was excited to find out that a lot of this stuff is actually um, appeared back in version 1.0 of I2B2. Even even modifiers, which were not um, you know documented and deeply used, but the the uh, Intuition behind modifiers was was there since the beginning. That, that just kind of an aside, but I thought that was fun. Um, and uh, it's on the ITB2 community wiki. It's also on the Transmart Foundation page. We've released it as a beta version, um, just to say that it's still being finalized. So in the version information, it's listed as 0 0.9. And that's just to highlight that we're still looking for um, still looking for community reviews of it. We are still making some tweaks to it. We're adding a few things, um, but it's it's certainly in a usable form now. Um, I, I guess I'll say right now, if anyone wants to uh, read this document in an editable form, I can make you a commenter on the Google Doc that we're sourcing this all from. Um, and uh, I mean, you're also welcome to just send one of us comments on it, but. If you, uh, if you want to look at the Google Doc, if you have a more extensive editing job you want to do, that would be great. So, if I, so I'll, show, I'll just show where it is before I click on it. If you go to the community wiki and scroll down, there's a link on documentation on the left right now that says I2B2 Common Data Model Guide. And um, if you go to the I2B2 Transmart Foundation, a big button right on the home page. Um, just above Zach's picture that shows the common data model. And they both go to the same link. So you can go here. You can also download this, I believe, as a PDF. Uh, so things that we've got in here, um, we have uh, a quick start guide, table fields and descriptions, tutorials on using the, the CDM, and then some advanced topics, uh, including you know, OMOP data and multiple fact tables and encryption. Uh, so just scrolling through this, you can see it has a lot of information. It has some uh, diagrams and uh, links down here. It has, uh, oh, it has tutorials on how these tables are used. I'm actually adding um, a, a, a Google Sheet version of the demo data, at least the facts table in the demo data, that pe so people can really just flip through the demo data and see what it looks like. Um, as we go further, further down in here, that's all about how the data is arranged. Um, then we have. Uh, we have a link to the schema reference. This is the spreadsheet that I showed a screenshot of earlier. 
that shows all of the, uh, the core tables and fields in the um, in the core data. Um, scroll down further, we have links to the actual detailed documentation on the fact table um, and dimension table uh, definitions. So this is this is a link to existing documentation, which we have we have updated <laughs> as we found um, some some pieces of it were outdated. But th these are existing documentation on the wiki, but we've kind of consolidated all into one place, the links that you might want to follow for the table definitions, joining columns, things like that. We have some tutorials on using the CDM for diagnoses, demographics, labs, um, values, medications, notes, and so forth. And so this, is, uh, this has been quite a, um, uh, quite a project that's uh, taken a lot of effort um, by Griffin, myself, Mike Mendez, Sean, Rudy, Peter Rice, and so this has been this has been really a, 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 an, a an effort that I've enjoyed, kind of bringing a lot of things together that were really just kind of folk knowledge that were collected in ad hoc ways for for the whole time I've been using I2B2. Um, eventually, we'd like to extend extend this to also document how the ontology works, but. For this for this round for this year, we have we have done this, and so please take a look at it. And if you have any feedback, or if you want to have the editable version, then let one of us know, and we'd be happy to share it with you. And I hope that it um, makes your holiday season a little brighter, so you can learn about how I2B2's data model uh, now works the same in both I2B2 and Transmart, and um, all these tutorials will certainly be good holiday reading. Right? <laughs> uh, but, okay, that's all I've got, Rudy. Thanks. All right, thanks, Def. <clears throat> it's a little big for a stocking stuffer, so. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps too many pages. Maybe a little. But uh, it's just, uh, it's an incredible um, job uh, pulling all this together. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, thanks again, thanks to Dell for uh, their support. So next topic, I'll just uh, pre, uh, very quickly talk about another project that uh, was was funded by by Dell this year, um, part of uh, our, our COVID um, uh, work with Transmart. Um, uh, we um, we put together a datathon. Uh, this datathon was supported by, um, as I say, by the Dell projects, but. Um, we worked, it was a collaboration between the foundation, uh, Axiomatics, uh, OSPF, uh, the Open um, Science Pharma Foundation, uh, and uh, the Mayo Clinic Tubercul the Mayo Clinic Tuberculosis um, Clinic. And uh, we uh, were decided to hold it. We held a, a datathon um, in 2015 uh, on neurodegenerative diseases, and it was, it was very, very popular. Um, we had a uh, Good group. Everybody came together in uh, this one room in Boston, and they uh, worked hard for, for three days. Um, very focused. Uh, you know, they had dinner and, and you know uh, spent evenings together, and, and it was really a, a great session. And we thought, well, we had to do it virtual this year, of course, and so we would just have a virtual day on. And uh, we we pulled this together, and um, uh, it was not not quite as easy as as we thought uh, because it's a, a little bit different when you have. Um, Everyone is, is working out of their homes. They have all the other things that they're doing and distractions and all. And uh, it turned out to be um, kind of challenging, but we had 14 people participating um, who uh, worked on a number of, of uh, topics um, on the, the COVID uh, uh, <clears throat> virus. Um, pulled together a, a lot of resources. Um, uh, here you see the, the, the groups that were, were working with us. We put together a, a, yeah, an actual site uh, website for the datathon. There are a lot of resources. We had some training sessions. We had um, uh, things from, we had, uh, we, we loaded into Transmart uh, about uh, almost 200 data sets from GEO uh, on um, uh, the, both the, uh, the COVID-19 virus, but also MERS and SARS and a few other things that we were able to find. And so um, uh, one of the, another company that I work with, Gentium, we had a, an actual uh, COVID-19 um, uh, magazine in terms of all the articles that were available, plus the um, uh, whole uh, knowledge knowledge um, network. Um, and 
the teams had access to all these things. Um, we, um, the, the other issue, you know, we had a couple of, of, of things that we observed, right? So first of all, people were not really dedicated in spending their time full time these days. Uh, and so as it uh, unfolded, uh, the other thing, we were spread across the world. We had people across the US, different time zones. We had people in Europe and uh, three in, in India. So it was quite challenging for the teams even to get together uh, and work uh, across all these things. And so at one point the, they asked if we could extend it. So we extended the data uh, for, for 10 days. Unfortunately, it spanned Thanksgiving holiday for the US. Uh, and so, you know, we had a lot of lessons learned here and um, uh, the, it was, I think, you know, it was, it was an interesting experience for everyone. Um, the actual website is still there, all these resources, if you're interested, you can poke around and, and take a look at um, uh, some of the things that uh, they had available to them. But I think from the lessons we've learned here, we had some, we really, uh, I think, had a, a good idea on how to put something that make, maybe not quite the datathon, hackathon experience, but, but something that really is focused on, you know, maybe a one month thing that we, we have it, you know, organized in a different way. And so, um, but uh, it, it still was, I think, an interesting um, uh, activity. I think some of the, the resources and all that we pulled together were quite interesting. Uh, so I invite you to take a look at that if you're interested and see what we did and then stay tuned. We're, uh, we have some plans uh, that we're working on for 2021. So that's what I wanted to discuss with that. Um, I think now we have our, um, our guest speaker for today. Uh, Jean-Louis Rosaro will be uh, talking about Medco and I'll be turning over to him. Hello everybody and thanks Rudy for the introduction. I'll try to share my screen if you give me- You, um, you should be able to share it now. Okay, so I'll try to to summarize a little bit the work we did around uh, Medco. So Medco is a joint work between uh, uh, EPFL, uh, which is the Federal Institute of Technology in, uh, in Switzerland. One of the two, so there's EPFL and ETH in Zurich. And, and SHUV, which is the Lausanne University Hospital, uh, which is my, my employer currently. Um, so um, the project has been, uh, you know, active since uh, uh, for, for the last uh, three, four years, I think. And now we are we're really getting into a phase where we are uh, very close to to roll out a, a production ready version of the, of the software. So um, I, I wanted to to explain you a little bit what what Medco is. Um, so what what are the operating principles and the main features? And unfortunately, I won't be able to do a, a live demo because it's still under uh, development. So we, we don't have a stable version, but I can, I can show you a few screenshots to just give you an idea of what, what we can do with Medco. Uh, then importantly, also, I, I, I wanted to, to give you a little, a little bit of overview of the legal positioning of Medco because Medco utilizes uh, some data protection technologies. So we did an analysis with respect to, to GDPR uh, in terms of data protection and talk a little bit about roadmap and, and future releases afterwards. So you have a, you have a website, so it's medco.epfl.ch where you can find um, all, the, all, the, all the information about, about the tools. So the papers that are, uh, that explain the technology behind it, the technical documentation, and also you, the links to the, to the GitHub repo uh, where you can download and, and, and test the tool yourself. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of um, context, so, so Medco is a project that started in uh, 2017 with the Swiss Personalized Health Network Initiative, uh, which together with the PHRT, so the Personalized Health and Related Technologies Initiative, is, are the two uh, main initiatives for personalized medicine in Switzerland. Um, so we are just wrapping up the first two phases, uh, the first phase of these two initiatives um, that has like provided several millions of francs for, for projects like Medco and also more driver clinical projects. But essentially the goal is to build up the infrastructure in Switzerland to enable data sharing across hospitals and universities uh, for, to facilitate uh, personalized medicine research. So. Um, one of the projects that has been uh, funding Medco is this uh, data protection and personalized health project, uh, which is the project of, um, of the PHRT, um, 
which is responsible for uh, providing solutions that address the privacy, security, and scalability and ethical challenges uh, tied to personalized medicine. And it involves essentially people from uh, the Federal Institute of Technology, so EPFL and, uh, and ETH. Uh, so the, the laboratory of Jean-Pierre Ribot, uh, LDS, is, is actually the, the, the main uh, developer of, of Netco. And then one spin-off project uh, of this uh, data protection and personalized health in, uh, program is the Medco project. So one of the tools that the program is uh, is uh, sponsoring uh, is, is is essentially Medco. So here we have involved like hospital partners. So we have uh, Lausanne University Hospital de Chuve, the Geneva University Hospital HUG, and Insel Spital. Uh, which is the hospital, the university hospital in Bern. Uh, so the project, uh, the goal of the project was to take uh, an academic prototype and bring it to a hospital compliant uh, operational system. Um, and by the end of 2020, deployed in at least uh, three Swiss university hospitals and, and, and tested on, on a real use case. So this is what we, what we've done. Uh, so, so the main motivation for, for the project was that like uh, health data management, the current situation of health data management is, is pretty unsustainable. Um, and what we believe uh, is that we can use uh, appropriate tools and, and processes that have mathematically proven uh, guarantees uh, to facilitate data sharing uh, in such a way that we can really uh, reinforce uh, trust between patient and, 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 and healthcare providers and facilitate uh, data management uh, for, for research. So we all know, I don't think I need to spend time on this slide, we all know that data sharing is important for precision medicine and there are several challenges. So one is data interoperability, of course, uh, then also the, the let's say the heterogeneity of, of, of the different jurisdictions and the several ethical committees that are involved in the process of data sharing are also like uh, bottlenecks and challenges that uh, we need to, to overcome somehow. So, so there are different approaches for, for data sharing. So uh, there's the centralized approach where patient level data is centralized into central database. Um, usually you know, provided by a, a trusted third party. And then like researchers get, can get access to this uh, centralized data database and then perform data curation and data analysis. Uh, so, so this is typical of initiatives like, uh, for example, the All of Us program, EGA Genomics England. Um, and it works, it, it works pretty well. So, so however, it, it comes with problems because like there's sort of a, uh, loss of control of, of, of raw data, because once data is transferred to this trust third party, you basically uh, data providers lose control of the data. And then from a security perspective, uh, centralizing data in one single place is, is not always a good idea because this central place can represent uh, a single point of failure in a system. So there are alternatives ways of, of um, of sharing data, one which is the site level uh, meta-analysis where, where essentially um, given, given, given a particular study or particular analysis, each center performs uh, the, the local analysis locally and then the aggregated data is centralized and, and then put together uh, by, a, by a third party. Uh, but this is often um, you know, uh, you, you still need to trust the central server and often like the heterogeneity of local data distribution can, can generate some bias in the results. So one of the, the latest, um, you know, paradigm that has been emerged, uh, that has been emerging in the last few years is the really fully decentralized um, data sharing approach or also federated uh, analysis approach where essentially the, the, the main principle is that the algorithm is sent to the data and then there are a certain number of inter, uh, interactions between the different parties 
um, in order to perform uh, the analysis in such a way that the result is comparable to, uh, to the results you would obtain in the centralized uh, scenario. Of course, uh, the, the meta-analysis and decentralized scenario are more privacy preserving because patient level data doesn't leave uh, the hospital IT infrastructure, but there's only aggregate level data that is uh, shared. So uh, we, 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 we might think that sharing this is, sharing aggregate data is privacy preserving. Uh, it is to some extent when, when uh, let's say the, the number of patients on which the, uh, the analysis performed is, is, is large enough so, such that the, the data, the aggregate data cannot be reused for, for re-identification. Uh, but the more and more data we add to the patients and the more and more stratification we do, like for rare diseases or precision medicine use case, the more uh, the aggregate level data becomes identifying. So even if patient level data is not shared, uh, aggregate, uh, sharing aggregate level data in some contexts might, um, might be subject to, to data, data leakages and, and re-identification attacks. Uh, so what we propose with Matco is to basically address this problem. Uh, so we, we provide a software platform that enables distributed uh, analysis of data, so cohort exploration and federated learning or federated analytics. Um, and to protect aggregate level data uh, under when, when, it's, when it's transferred for, for, for the sake of the analysis, we use a secure multi-party computation and homomorphic encryption. So, and, and these are two te techniques from the cryptographic uh, community that have been around for uh, more than a decade, but like very recently have become uh, practical uh, in the sense that the overhead, the computational overhead introduced by those technologies um, has been reduced as such that they can now be used for, for real world applications. So in, in Medco, we, we, we like to distinguish between the, the Medco Explorer feature, which is a, a, a very similar to, to the Shrine uh, features. So it's cohort exploration is what you could do with I2B2, but in a, in a distributed uh, fashion. And then we have the medical analysis, which is more the, the, the analytics part. So once you have identified your cohort, you're able to compute uh, some analytics on, on top of it in a, in a distributed way. So at the moment we have uh, integrate implemented survival analysis uh, and we have uh, uh, MVPs for uh, training of generalized linear models and neural networks that are not still integrated into Medco, but they, they will be integrated uh, by the end of next year. So uh, Medco is currently deployed in, in these three university hospitals. Um, and uh, we are about to use it for uh, Swiss personal oncology. So the, the Swiss Personal Oncology Program is a, is a nationwide program for, for oncology. And uh, they have a so-called uh, molecular tumor board. And what they plan to, to do with Medco is to have a sort of real-time platform that will, uh, given, given, a, uh, given a patient profile, can, can provide information about uh, survival for different uh, treatment arms. Um, so the, the operating principle of Medco is, is, is very simple. So if you, if you know Shrine, there's not much difference. So uh, Medco is also based on, on I2B2. So the Medco database is, uh, is actually the I2B2 database. So from, from uh, the EHR system of the hospital, there is an ETL process that brings data uh, into Medco. And then the, the researcher can use the, the web interface uh, to perform a request on the data. A request can be a selection of a cohort or a, a computation on the data. And then the, the request comes at each uh, data provider. Uh, so the, this kind of deployment is the same for, for, for every hospital. And then the, the, the computation is, is performed locally and the result of the computation is encrypted with uh, this homomorphic encryption. And then whatever computation happens uh, in an interactive and iterative fashion, 
it's always performed under encryption. So at no point in time, uh, there's there is a party or uh, any party that can see uh, the, the partial aggregates that are coming out of uh, hospitality infrastructure. And in the end, uh, the, the researcher is the only one who can decrypt the result, and this is totally transparent to him uh, as the, the, the web uh, client, as the, the, the key information to, to decrypt the result and, and display it for visualization. So um, there are three, the, 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 I, I group the features of Medco in three main categories. So uh, data representation, the privacy and security features, and the, the federated functionalities. So the, the data representation, uh, we, we, we basically reuse the high to be two common data model that Jeff um, showed before. So the star schema that, that's very flexible, flexible because it allows you to store more or less any kind of data provided that you, you have an ontology to describe it. And, uh, and, uh, and the ontology has to be the same uh, for, for, for all the hospitals. And then what we have built is, um, is a particular ETL uh, framework that it's able to bring in data that it's in RDF uh, into, into I2B2 format. Uh, why RDF? Uh, uh, actually, RDF is the, is the data representation chosen by uh, the Swiss Personalized Health Network to achieve uh, uh, semantic interoperability. So I, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but essentially, um, one of the deliverables of this uh, Swiss personalized network is um, a set of semantic definitions of, of several concepts that can be mapped uh, to uh, standard ontologies like SNOMED or ICD-10 or ATC. And then we use uh, RDF, which is, a, which is a semantic web technology to, to describe semantics in a graph-like uh, fashion where like concepts are, are known in a graph and, and uh, properties of concepts are um, edges in the graph. Um, so we can easily map from, from, a, from a, let's say a tabular description of semantic into a graph representation. And then data uh, of lo locally, the data of each hospital is mapped to this RDF ontology and, and each hospital can then build its own interoperable part of the of the graph. And what we have built is just something that takes in RDF uh, data in the in the total format and, and, and it's able to, to load directly uh, into I2B2. So one of the challenges we had here was to um, essentially generate I2B2 ontology, which is in a tree-like uh, structure uh, from something which is in a acyclic graph. So we basically relied on the on the uh, triple logic of RDF, so subject, predicate, and object, and mapped it to to let's say the triple uh, I2B2 representation of concept, modifier, and value. Um, so we we were what we did was basically mapping nodes to concepts, uh, edges to modifiers, and values to to data. So in the end, what, what, what happens in, uh, in Switzerland at least is that like data from each year system is then like uh, segmented for a different use case. So we have different data marts uh, for different projects like oncology, uh, ICU, geriatric, uh, and so on. And then all this data is mapped to a common semantic uh, and the output is an RDF graph, which is interoperable across hospitals. And uh, data is currently being shared in, uh, in, in Switzerland through the RDF total format. And then we have a biomed IT uh, security infrastructure, uh, which can host data from multiple hospitals and give access to researchers to analyze data in this infrastructure. And what we wanted to for Medco was to essentially um, nullify the, the effort of hospitals to bring in data into, into I2B2 uh, therefore, we built like an ETL framework to bring the same data that is currently shared with uh, this uh, IT infrastructures uh, to, to be able to be loaded into Medco. So for the federated functionalities, so very simple. So this is the shrine functionality. So you want to know how many individuals have a, a set of uh, particular features 
and then the tool gives you back the answer. Uh, the only difference with, with, with the shrine is that like the local counts of each hospital gets encrypted and then it's aggregated under encryption. So there's nobody who sees the, the count of, of, uh, of the separate hospitals unless it is authorized. And then what we can do uh, afterwards is the analysis part. Uh, so once we have identified a cohort, uh, the patient level data stay uh, where it is. And then we can run uh, either statistical analysis like uh, overall survival, like Kaplan measures, or train uh, generalized linear models like, such as linear regression, logistic regression, or push it also towards uh, more complex uh, uh, complex models like uh, neural networks. So uh, the principle for, for cohort exploration is exactly what I, I just told you before. And for data analysis, what we have implemented is a, is a, is a special micro ETL, which given the, the specific type of analysis, uh, extract data from the I2B2 data model and put it like in a tabular format and then um, we perform the local analysis on the, on the tabular format, encrypts the output. And then uh, the model, if we assume like a neural network model, the, mod the model gets updated uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion um, and then comes back. And uh, here we have again the, the encrypted model and then the encrypted model is trained for another iteration on the, on the clear text patient level data and so on and so forth until, until uh, the model converges. And, and in the end, uh, the researcher can decide if he wants to decrypt the model or just use the model uh, encrypted to, to, to have uh, and, and perform predictions and just decrypt the predictions. So these, these are two different uh, use cases we, we enable. So from the privacy security features, so the two technologies we use, as I mentioned before, are secure multi-party computation uh, so this is a technique, a uh, cryptographic technique that ensures that when you have like multiple data providers that want to compute a, a given function on their private data, but they don't want to reveal anything uh, about their data to the other parties, they can use these techniques uh, to ensure uh, that like all the data remain private and uh, the only thing that is disclosed is, is the final result. Um, one of the limitation of secure multi-party computation is that uh, it, it's very communication intensive. So there are a lot of back and forth of messages and encrypted messages between the different parties. Um, and the other technique we're using is homomorphic encryption. So homomorphic encryption is a particular type of encryption that allows you to do some computations on the encrypted domain. Uh, so if you assume uh, you have an operation that is this uh, circle operation that you can do on the uh, clear text domain, uh, what homomorphic encryption guarantees you is that there's an equivalent uh, operation that can be performed on the encrypted domain uh, to end up in the same, to the same result. So you can either, either do the operations in the plain text and then encrypt or encrypt the operands and then do, do the operations uh, to get eventually the same result. And essentially, the combination of homomorphic encryption and secure multi-party computation is what we did in Medco to have something that we call multi-party homomorphic encryption, which, which takes the best of both worlds and, and uh, optimize uh, performance. Uh, so we have implemented uh, all of this in an open source uh, library, which is called Latigo. Uh, you, can, you can go and test it. Uh, so there, there are different operations you can do. There you, you can do um, integer arithmetic and also complex to complex and, and, and float point arithmetic uh, in a distributed way. So, so this is kind of the building block uh, that we use for implementing the secure uh, federated learning uh, techniques. So one of the requirements for uh, deploying Medco into, into hospital will also to be compliant with uh, IT security policies. Uh, so what we did was to mandate external uh, security companies to do penetration testing of the software and also code review. So, so the, the, the version of Medco that will be installed in hospital has been pen tested and, and, uh, and code reviewed. So it's compliant to hospital IT security policies. 
which are basically based on the top 10 OWASP uh, vulnerabilities. And then we have implemented the two-factor authentication protocol. Uh, so there, there's a Swiss uh, identity provider for, for, for research institutions. So we have a integration with that so that any researcher can use uh, two-factor authentication to get access to, to Meta. So something very, very important that I, I want to stress is also this legal analysis we did about um, uh, the use of advanced privacy native technologies for sharing medical data. Essentially, it's a collaboration we did with uh, Professor Effi Vajena from uh, ETH Zurich, which is, who is a uh, worldwide expert in, in LC uh, related topics. So we have a archive uh, paper that is currently under, under peer review. But essentially what, what, we, what we claim in the paper and what we believe is that like, um, thanks to uh, this multi-party homomorphic encryption, I won't go into the detail, but essentially the data that is under the encryption can be considered uh, anonymized in a, in a GDPR sense. And this has implications that are, that are um, uh, very important uh, because, for example, if you use MedCode to compute uh, across uh, jurisdictions or across like uh, member states in, in, in Europe, you don't need a bilateral data transfer agreements uh, to, to share the aggregate level data uh, across data providers because the data is, uh, can be considered anonymous. And then there are, there are a certain number of provisions for data controllers that do not apply anymore because anonymized data, it's not under the scope of GDPR anymore. And this is, uh, we believe, a, a potential, a tremendous potential for streamlining RB approval and really uh, accelerate uh, access to, to distributed data sets. Um, so from a user experience perspective, so we, we reused the, the Glowingbear UI that was developed by the Hive. So we forked the UI and we integrated uh, uh, most of the functionalities that are in the I2B2 UI. So we can query uh, with modifiers now uh, through Glowingbear. Uh, we can also query by, by ranges, by dates. Uh, and uh, something that it's also also nice that was not present in Glowingbear when we started was the, the capability of saving cohorts. Uh, so this is very simple. So you, you, you drag and drop your concepts. So this is just an example on an oncological data set where you're looking for people with a mutation in the BRAF gene and then who have melanoma and are male. And then, as I said, the query is sent to all the hospitals uh, the result, it's encrypted, combined together, and eventually you get the final result uh, that shows you, okay, you have 273 subjects that match your query. So you have different query types. So you have count per site, you have global count as, as in this case, or you also have a patient set uh, that you can see. So depending on your access right, you can, you can see different, different uh, result type. And then you can save your cohort um, and do some distributed statistics. Um, so you can visualize uh, so some breakdowns by age. So this is, this is the same of, as I2B2, there's nothing really new here. We just integrated these features into, into Blowing Bear. Uh, and then the analysis part. So once you switch on the analysis, you can select uh, one of the cohorts you built before, and then you have a, a sort of library of predefined um, tools that you can use. So at the moment, we only have survival analysis that it's implemented, uh, but we are currently integrating all these other uh, all these other features. And essentially, in survival analysis, what you can do is to create uh, subgroups so you can stratify your cohort with uh, additional criteria, and then you can define a little bit the time granularity of your survival curves, uh, the the maximum time span and also what are your uh, time to event uh, concept that you want to observe and what's the start event. And then in the end, you have something like this uh, where you have, you, you have different groups and, and uh, survival curves for, for different groups and, and a certain number of statistics 
uh, that tells you how, how different are the two, the, the two curves. Um, so, the, as I told in the beginning, like uh, we are currently uh, loading MEDCO with uh, oncological data for the Swiss Molecular Tumor Board, where oncologists will be able to uh, do the two types of queries. So, explore queries like finding uh, how many adult cancer patients have consent uh, for reusing data for research, have a certain type of diagnosis, a uh, certain type of mutation and a certain type of treatment, for example. And then uh, the, the, the clinician, the oncologist can, can also run some uh, quick survival analysis uh, to see, for example, the difference um, of survival of people who have a mutation on a particular position in the gene or, or not. Um, of course, uh, Medco, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, use case agnostic. So this is uh, the first use case we, we are uh, working on, but uh, there are, we're also talking with other um, you know, specialties to, to see how, how we can best leverage uh, Medco. So we, we, we did a little bit of comparison, like, like to try to position Medco with respect to existing uh, open source uh, data sharing, distributed data sharing platform. So um, because we are reusing most of the uh, I2B2 functionality, we have, we have the same cohort exploration features as, as the shrine. We, we have the same possibility of having a flexible data model but in addition to Shrine, for example, uh, we have this uh, federated analytics part um, that provides further, further functionalities. Uh, and this is something that other platforms uh, already provide, like DataShield, uh, which is a platform, a uh, common light platform uh, working on, on R, uh, statistical uh, programming language. Uh, developed in the UK. Then we, we have the Vantage 6 platform, the, which is the, the platform from the Personalized Health Train Initiative in the Netherlands, uh, which can also provide federated analytics and the, uh, the medical informatics platform of the Human Brain Project. Uh, this is a flagship European project uh, and they also provide uh, cohort exploration, federated analytics and uh, flexible data model. Actually, this medical informatics platform, it's also based on I2B2. Uh, what, in, in what Medco, uh, it's, it's, uh, we believe superior to, to, to the other platforms is really the privacy and security features. As, as, I, as I told you, uh, we provide protection of, of, uh, uh, of local data. We will provide protection as of V3, but what we provide right now is the protection of the intermediate results, so the aggregate data. And all the, the computation that happen in a distributed way, it's also done under encryption. And we also provide protection of the end result similarly to what Shrine does. So we use a differential privacy to blur the statistics uh, before, the, before the decryption so that re-identification is made uh, more difficult. Uh, a main, one main difference, this, this is just a subtlety, but uh, Differential, the obfuscation is just applied at the very end, so it's not applied by each clinical site, uh, but it's just applied on the on the final aggregation. And this is because we use encryption, so we don't need to trust any any third party in the middle. And then, yeah, we have the same as Shrine, so graphical user interface, public API, and it's extensible, so you can integrate new functionalities um, in in a kind of easy way. So now we are really trying to explore the sustainability model for, for Medco. Uh, so it's currently under evaluation by the Swiss Personalized Network. So if the evaluation is positive, then Medco will be deployed as a national tool for, for cohort exploration and feasibility analysis. So some funding will come centrally from SPHN. And then we, we are trying to build a, a self-sustainable model where clinical projects that want to use Medco for federated analytics, uh, then they can, they should provide resources for customization that go beyond what we, what SPHN provides by default. And then we, we keep trying to, uh, to get some grants for R and D projects where we, we keep pushing the development of Medco. So this is a little bit the roadmap. Uh, so we will release V2, uh, by the end of this year, beginning of the next. So V2 is 
what, what I showed you. And V3 will be uh, the, the, the version with Merkel analysis with all the um, privacy preserving distributed uh, generalized Dino models. So here's you have the paper that describes how to do this in uh, under homomorphic encryption and also the neural networks part. And here, here's the point to the paper if you are interested. So we also uh, recently started an initiative uh, called SCORE, uh, which, which is planning to use MEDCO to facilitate data sharing for uh, COVID uh, research. So there are a number of institutions that are participating. So now we are trying to get like a core set of uh, sites that have resources to uh, deploy MEDCO and work uh, on, a, on a common, data, common ontology. Um, so we also have, yeah, Medco is one of the I2B2 official community projects. Uh, and and uh, we have also other collaborations with the Personalized Health Train Initiative, also Harvard Medical School and GA4GH. And so this is just my last slide. So uh, I hope you understood what, what Medco can, can do more or less. Um, and it was designed with, uh, with the requirements of the Swiss Personalized Health Network in mind. Um, and it provides a really a way to share data without transferring them. So no loss of control, there's, which implies higher motivation to share data and higher willingness to harmonize data formats. It's highly secure. Um, so we hope it can streamline and facilitate the ethics approval because data process under Medco can be considered anonymous in, in a legal GDPR sense. So no need of uh, uh, really, really heavy legal legal contracts uh, between institutions, and the first application it's uh, on Swiss personalized ecology. So I'm happy to take questions. And I'm, I'm sorry I went a little bit uh, beyond the time, uh, but I'm but I'm pretty much available offline if you want to 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 get more details. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Jean Louis. We had one question about the open source license um, that you're using, um, th that you're distributing under. Um, yeah. So, so we are we have a end users license agreement, which is uh, which uh, basically says that you can use and distribute Medco uh, free for non-commercial purposes. So at the moment we have this license, of course, this only covers the encryption part. So uh, all, all the I2B2, uh, Bloemberg, this, this is the original license, of course. Uh, but what we bring is just the, the, the encryption layer for the secure federated analytics part. Um, and, and this is under this uh, EULA uh, license. So everybody can use it for academic purposes or research purposes. Um, you cannot use it if you put it behind a paywall, for example, or if you if you make profit uh, out of it. Uh, and if what? you want to do so, you have to enter into negotiation with EPFL, who, who owns the, the the intellectual property rights. What, what about Lati Latigo? Sorry. What about um, the, the Latigo that you're using? Is that is that open source? Uh, I. I... Latigo. Is not very good. Can can you can you repeat? Um, you're using a, another piece of. You talked about Let, Letigo. Yeah, Letigo, Letigo is is, a, is a, that's open source. Uh, I I don't remember exactly, but it's uh, it's uh, it's either Mozilla or or GPL. But okay. it's, this is fully open source. Yeah, the core okay. cryptography uh, part is open source. Then if you want the the algorithms that use this cryptographic library are under EULA. Um, so here there's the, the GitHub repo. Yep. Um, and then you have the license here that explains you the condition, but it's more or less what I, what I just told you. Okay. Um, Any other questions from anyone? Put a note in the chat window. Um, unmute yourself and just ask. I think you should be able to. Uh, well, I thought this was great, and we're already over time, so I hate to ask my question. But I was curious what those four platforms were that you had in your uh, slide, because I didn't recognize them, except Shrine. 
and Medco. But there were a couple others, and I wasn't sure if those are. Yeah. So there is are. a data shield. It's a distributed uh, analytics platform developed by Newcastle University in, in the UK. Uh, so it's been around for, for, for a while. Um, and it, it does not have a, a let's say, a graphical user interface. So it's, it's, it's more like for, for really statistical experts. And then you have Vantage 6, which is a platform that was actually recently presented at the AMIA annual symposium. And it's the, the platform for the personalized health train initiative in the Netherlands. So it's very similar to Medco, um, but it doesn't come to, with the you know, privacy preserving features that Medco has. So it has some limitation in that sense. And then we have the, the medical informatics platform of the Human Brain Project. Um, and this is another platform that has been developed in that in that context. So it's more a European project, um, and it also uses I two B two as a, as a backbone uh, data model. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, also, uh, David Diamond put in the uh, chat window the uh, the actual link to the paper uh, on the the legal and technical and ethical analysis. Thank you, David. If anyone wants to take a peek at that and grab it, the link. Yeah, then, then all the all the links are in the in the slides. So yeah, yeah. Just if somebody wants it right away, it's right. He put it in for us. Okay. Well, thank then, you very much. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Then yeah, uh, something you can if you're interested in, in testing Medco. So we have a, from from the website. Uh, you can go on the software. And then we have a technical documentation and everything is, is um, packaged in Docker containers. So the deployment, it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, you can, we can have like, you can have local deployment. You can test like several, simulate several nodes on one, on one single server. So you can get a flavor of how it works. Um, yeah. So the, the really the V2, so the, the next version with all the features I described will, will come out in January. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. This, um, thank you, John Louis. This was this was really fantastic, and we'll have um, we'll have the slide deck posted in our um, on our website shortly. Um, and I really just want to wish everybody a, a safe and uh, happy uh, holiday, and we will see you all next year.